All right, we'll give it a second to spool up, listening to the spool up recitations. Spool up. Oh, that was a gotta mute the stream. There we go. Okay, and while we're waiting, I'll get the couple stragglers on attendance. All right, so uh, if you're curious what this is, this is the the recitation part of Heike. And this is actually from the one where he throws the little chits into the river. So we'll, we'll get into this one more as we go. And how would you get to know I was going to have more of that? All right, so today we're a little bit behind. Um, Specifically, we, we've got two slides behind where I want it to be. But welcome, everybody. Today we're doing the Tale of the Heike again. Part two, if you missed part one, you can find it on... Oop, that's not the right one. Oh, it is the right one. Good. If you missed any of this, you can find it on YouTube and Twitch for probably another week. Great. Yeah, I, I, it's one of those nights. Anyway. So uh, we're going to start two slides behind where we left off. So let me find where I was. Here we go. So we were in Chapter 2 last time for Tale of the Heike. And we're going to jump right in. Let me get my notes set up. All right. Uh, yeah. And I think we didn't even start Chapter 2, if that matches my memory. Because I, oh, I, yeah, I think we might actually be one slide back. I think we looked, oh, we did this slide last, and we stopped here, and I showed us this picture. Uh, my internet is very slow. If your internet's super slow, uh, my advice would be change the resolution. How can I say it? Change the resolution you're taking it to a low resolution. As long as you can hear me and kind of read the slides, you should be fine. Uh, somebody asked a pre-question. Is, is there a way to get better immersed in the tale of AK? Is there some dates? I should not follow, even with the notes from Pillow Book. 15 is the first months of Nipe 3. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So if you look, whenever they list the date, they put the they put the, the Roman date, right, the Christian date in brackets. I basically ignore. When it says, like, uh, I'm looking at uh, 251, this is the beginning of Book 5, it says the capital was above on the third and sixth, oh, the third of the six months of G, uh, Jisho 4. And it says 1180. Just remember 1180. You do not need to remember Jisho 4. Because in the old days, era names, the Nengo, were changed every couple of years just for good luck. So it's almost impossible to keep up with them, even if you did classic Japanese as like a focus. And I don't do it, and you're not doing it. So just use the Roman dates. So like this is like the 11... 1170s, right? That's what you need to know. So it's the 1170s, which is roughly 170 years after the pillow book, right? Just knowing that kind of range is fine. You don't need to actually know it. Oh, I have an ebook, so it's odd. So yeah, it's a, a, most of the stories are 1160s, and the war starts in the 1180. 1180. So the flashbacks tend to be to the 1160s, but the, the current tense, like once the fighting starts, it's 1180. That's all you gotta know. Everything else, just... They, and uh, the version we have, I don't know if you have the Penguin Classics, the students who asked this. If you have the Penguin Classics, it should have the dates there, but it might not. And if you've got another version, it definitely probably won't have them. So, in that case, just kind of know the age it's happening in, and that should help. And it looks like there's a couple other questions coming. All right, uh, let's go now. So this is where we stopped. We have the warrior monks, and if you haven't read that much today, it's sad for you because these guys just start doing life. Man, it's great. All right, so we're going to start getting into some of the proof. We've gotten into the kind of all up until now, and even the next couple chapters, a lot of it looks like, wait, how is this a war epic? Well, they're giving us backstory of kind of why are these guys bad guys. So we're slowly getting into, like, the things they do that make them, we'll say, reprehensible. That'd be a nice way to say it. So chapter two, 
Number one is called The Exile of the Abbot. Uh, why is this one? Well, we, it, it's basically demonstrating... Great. So I'm glad that worked out. The Retired Emperor's Influence, and this is Go Shirakawa. So, um, and if you, rem if you don't remember the titles and what they mean, uh, he is th his cloistered eminence, Go Shirakawa. Now, why is he cloistered eminence? Cloistered means you're monk, eminence means you're retired. So later, when his son have the conversation, uh, the son is eminence, and his dad is the cloistered eminence, and they're both retired emperors. Uh, confusing, yes, but we'll, we'll get into it more. But so this is kind of a demonstration of both the retired emperor's power, and if you don't remember, the retired emperor is the one who raised the Heike up. But it also shows kind of abuse of power. This is the point. So uh, this is a story... Let me get my book out. Oh yeah, this is a story where we basically get a little bit more of... Uh, how can I say it? Where we get a little bit more of backstory on like bad things happening. So basically, people get accused of crimes, and last time we talked about... Oh, here we go. Uh, we talk, Basically, corrupt officials get promoted. So this is on the 65, if you have it. On the 11th of that month, uh, the, the cloistered prince instead became abbot of a place. And then, um, here we go. Oh, that, this is already too late. Yeah, we're talking about exiling an abbot. What did he do? Well, basically, the Buddhist monks would resist corrupt officials. Uh, some of the corruption includes, like, washing your horses in the monks' hot spring, or literally, like, starting fights with them. Because remember, they're warrior monks. They're not just monk monks. So monks can fight back. So we start to see the retired emperor's influence. He's able to get an abbot fired. And if you don't know what an abbot is, it's someone who runs a monastery. So it's like a bishop in the Christian sense. So he's able to get a bishop fired, the retired emperor, just because he doesn't like him. And we get some, uh, we'll say, how can we say it? We get some cor we get some corruption back and forth, and then we get to start to see anger of the monks. This is the part I w didn't want to skip here. Let's see. So this abbot gets exiled, which is too bad. And uh, But then we get kind of the reaction of these people. And the monks get super angry now. Um, and these are the Hei monks, by the way. If you don't remember, the quote-unquote the mountain. Mount Hei is the big palace temple complex in Kyoto. And they have lots of influence. So this guy, but the emperor manages to get him banned. And exiled. Now, this is, this is where you get uh, number two. And, by the way, these titles sometimes are only ever loosely tied to the chapter. The abbot one's pretty good. This one's a little bit less good, but I'll explain. So next we have the adept Yixing. And then the monks basically are deciding what to do. Like, what do we do? Do we save him? Do we rebel? Do we sit still? And then they basically... They, they're monks, right? So they're praying. So they pray to the god of their shrine... And then, uh, where is this part? This is where you get some of the interesting how they looked at the world. They're, as they're praying, they're upon a young man, uh, Surumaru by name, at this time in his 18th year, betrayed great distress in body and mind. Sweat poured from him, and all at once he began to rave. Juzenji has entered me, he cried. These are perhaps the later days, but nonetheless I fail to grasp how they can simply march our abbot off to some, um, some other distant province. The horror... Sorry about my sound quality, by the way. Let me fix that. There we go. The horror of this will last many lives. If this is how things are to be now, what is the good of remaining present here below the slopes of the mountain? And I love it. Even these guys, they ask the right question, by the way. If, if you ever have a run-in with a possessed person and they say they're your god or your king, um, this is the 70. They say, unconvinced... The monks addressed him. I love this test. If in truth you speak as an oracle, then we must offer you must offer proof. Return each of these without mistake to the monk who actually owns it. There were hundreds of elders present, each with a rosary in their hand, and they tossed all the rosaries onto the veranda. And then basically this kid returns them all exactly to all the people who threw them out. He proves he's possessed by their god, basically, and tells the monks, you gotta resist, baby. So what do they do? Well, they go get their they get their monk back. This is on seventy one. They go they go get their lord or their former abbot. I gotta get his name right. Let's see where did he go? Mayun Mayun is their abbot. They go find him, who's he's walking away to exile, 
and they get them and bring them in. So again, this is starting to show kind of the breakdown, right? So now we have, uh-oh, why is everything breaking down? Eh, good question. And then we get to kind of the, why is this chapter called the Ad of Yi Xing? Well, they use, they love to use, if you haven't noticed yet, Chinese illusions. Remember we talked about illusions and how you can refer to Chinese events? They refer back to a guy who, in Chinese history who was exiled because of false gossip. So again, if you're making an argument in medieval Japan, you have to make an ancient China argument for the best argument. Okay, now we get execution. Uh oh, yep. So uh, okay, so now we get. Uh, let's see. This is forty-four, or wait, seventy-four. Here we go. Okay. So news about, and this is the very beginning of number three: the execution of Sai Cole. News the monks had taken back their deposed abbot further enraged the cloistered emperor. The monks of Mount Hay have made trouble enough often before, Psycho said, but if you ask me, they've gone too far this time. So now there's a plan to do something about it, basically. And, uh, let's do what I want to miss here. Okay, so here we get some back and forth where they want to do something more against them, and we get some resistance. I'm just looking around here. And that the Cloistered Emperor doesn't do more, but we start to get... We get to get some rumblings of the Cloistered Emperor not only was messing with the monks, he was starting to... What would I say? It. He's starting to like start a, re a bad rebellion. What I mean is, if you didn't read this part yet, the cloistered emperor is... A, the, the reason he pissed off the monks is he basically promoted a bunch of incompetence to the provinces who harassed the monks. So, the cloistered emperor wants to overthrow the Heike, but he, he, all his followers are kind of incompetent. So, they start to try to start a rebellion. I say try. Um, they have a conspiracy against the Heike. And this is what Psycho gets executed for. Why? Well, the Kiyomori captures him, and then they torture him. <laughs> and then they kill him. And Psycho is a monk, actually, but he's part of the Imperials, the Emperor's uh, household, and trying to lead a rebellion and take over power from monks. But he gets captured, they discover a conspiracy against the Heike, and... Um, now the Emperor is in deep uh, doo-doo, let's just say it that way. Now the, the point of the story here, why it's relevant, is before this point, you could argue the Emperor and the Kiyomori of the Heike were about equal power, or even the Emperor was a little more, more powerful. After this, basically what we have is the Heike are like, the Emperor and his whole court are conspiring against me, and the Heike systematically try to purge everybody from the court. So the first one, they execute Psycho, who's the main advisor of the Cloistered Emperor. Ooh. Make sure I didn't drop too many frames. We didn't drop too many frames. Good. So now then we get this great word. The Lesser Remonstrance. If you don't know what a remonstrance is, it's to make a forcefully reproachful protest. It's a great word. Um, so for example, if you do moral correction especially, this is what a remonstrance is. So now we get some interesting interplay, especially in the family of the Taira, right? The Heike family does some interesting interplay. So we now get this guy, Narachika, who we've heard of before, who is one of the assistants of the Cloistered Emperor in Goshidakawa, if you're curious. Uh, and he gets captured. He gets invited. I love the Japanese part of the story. So all of these counselors of the Emperor get quote-unquote invited to come visit Kiyomori. Visit. And they already, Psycho already got visited, and we know what happened to him. So, Narachika gets invi invited to come hang out, and he panics. Like, he says, uh, let's see, this is before his remonstrance? Let me see. Yeah, this is during the execution. He says, oh dear, he must have heard about the cloistered eminence planning to attack Mount Hei and wants me to stop him. And then he figures out, uh-oh, they figured out, they figured out the plan. So then he gets captured, 
and they beat the poop out of them. Do I have the picture here? Let me see. Did I upload this one? I don't think I did. Hold on, let me check my my array of pictures. We did not get this one yet. That's fine. So he then Kiyomori interrogates these guys and beats them up. Now, if you want to see Saigo's interrogation, it's on seventy nine. Uh, originally, poor little um, Natashika not a chica just gets put in a closet but eventually he gets uh actually tortured so here we go dripping with sweat shut up in a tiny room not a chica said to himself oh no that business we've been planning must have leaked out but who leaked it and he starts to panic and then this is so far seething with rage so he gets dragged out by kiyomori seething with rage kiyomori glares at the figure before him i should have taken care of you back in heiji he said but shigemori offered his life for yours until I relented. That is why you still have your head. What have you got to say about that? And he gets really mad and gets two of his guys start beating him up. Now, if you don't remember who Shigemori is, Shigemori is Kiyomori's only good son. Now, why is this chapter called The Lesser Rest Remonstrance? Well, Shigemori tries to save him again. And he basically makes a justice argument. If you want to see this, it's on, let's see, 83. So, basically, some of the word sneaks out. That, hey, um, your dad, hey, Shigemori, your dad, Kiyomori, is going to kill Narachika, the guy you like. So, and then we get the advice. This is on 83. Uh, you should think carefully, said, before you do with Narachika. And then they talk about his ancestors a bit. Uh, and in the cloistered sovereign's eyes, he enjoys favor beyond compare. I venture to doubt that it would be wise to impulsively take his head. Banishment from the capital surely would do quite well enough. And then he gives a bunch of examples and uh, from history, basically proving why it's a good case. The slander in both cases was false, but neither man escaped banishment, a fate ascribed since heir of Emperor Daigo. So they talk about, oh, such things happen in the past. Imagine then, in these latter days, now that you have him in custody, what harm could it possibly do to wait before executing him? For as we read in the classics... When in doubt, lighten punishment, and increase the weight of reward. As you know, Narachika's younger sister is my wife, and Koremori, his son-in-law. You may imagine that I address you in this vein, but because he is a close relative, but that is not so. So if you're curious, Shigemori married his sister. But he says, no, I do not only do this for the sake of the world at large, for our sovereign and for our house. And then he gives more history of basically where unjust punishments happened in the past. And then he says another, another Chinese quote. Here we go. Um, this is on 84, if you're curious. That is why men of old, too, used to say, executions multiply rebels. And so it was two years later, and he gives more examples where when people got executed, they want to fight more. He says, not a cheek on the other hand, possesses no great threat as an enemy of the court. Neither side is a reason for fear. You yourself, glory cannot last much longer, and you probably need not worry. But undoubtedly, you wish your children and grandchildren good fortune. So he basically makes a moral argument that killing unnecessarily is bad for their whole house. And this keeps going. This goes from page 84, 85, until the end of 86. And a lot of Chinese, a lot of Japanese examples. And uh, the best part, it works. Now, we get we start to get our edgy quotes again. Um, where was this? At the very end of this chapter, it says, So it begun until yesterday, but in the one night everything had changed. There it was, all too plain to see, the truth that the mighty must fall. Joy, once over, yields to sorrow. So wrote Oe no Atsuna. And indeed, how right he was. Again, this story is kind of letting us know People are great. People are starting to fall. Crazy times are coming. But why is this called lesser remonstrance? Basically, Shigemori, the son, convinces Kiyomori, his dad, who's ruling everything at this point, to spare a guy's life. And he gives says, "Okay, I'll give him exile." And if you want to see the guy's names, they're right here. So Narichika is saved by Shigemori. So, and again, it's an interesting kind of like Confucian style correction by the better son. And we get to see more of Shigemori Kiss's character. All right, you have any questions? Now's the time. Um, 
Somebody says, uh, the, in the version I have, the abbot that's kicked out is called Sashu, question uh, mark. In mine, he's called me, let me, what did I say, it was, uh, I gotta go look now. In this one, it's Mayun, that's his name. The abbot, this is on from one, I don't know what your says, the student who asked this, but uh, on chapter two, the first one, Exile of the Abbot, second line it says mayun but again this is why it's this is why i don't just recommend books but uh similar editions are better but if you didn't manage to do it that's okay if you as long as you have the abbot that's kind of what matters all right let's keep going i don't see any questions popping up yet so yeah and the monks are getting uppity and now we're starting to get uh, some more of the family politics all right now we get more pleading if you're curious we get what's called the plea of Naritsune. Now, who is Naritsune? He's the son of Narichika, the guy we just, well, the guy we just had almost killed. And now, um, the son. So, if you haven't noticed this yet, uh, Asia is not against communal punishments. What do we mean? The family gets punished for one member's faults. So a common practice here is to exile or, let's be honest, kill members of a family that rebel or go against the people in power. This is quite common. It's not only common in Asia, but if you go to Asia still, a lot of Asia still has communal punishments. It's a long tradition. For a lot of Anglos, it can seem horrifying. And why I say Anglos, in Anglo, which means English-speaking law, you always punish the individual. Basically, that's how the law works. But uh, in Asian law, that is not a thing. Uh, somebody asks, in the Lesser Remonstrance, they're using a lot of Chinese names. Yes, so they're, they're, they're all those names. If you read it, it gives more detail in the story. But they're all examples from the Chinese history. And that's how you make a good... It's considered a well-educated argument, like we learned from the Pillow Book. So the more you can make a Chinese illusion for your arguments, the better your argument's considered to be. And yeah, this book has less elaborate footnotes than uh, Pillow Book. It's one reason I like the Pillow Book. But this book's already like 800 pages, right? So if it had, or 700. If it had more notes, it would explode. All right, so now we get the plea for Naritsune. Now why? Well, he basically figures out he's next. And he says, uh, he goes, there's a messenger that shows up. Lord Kiramori wants to bring you straight to Nishihachijo, which is his house. And it says immediately, Naritsune understood what the matter was and called out the gentlewoman attending to the cloistered sovereign. He basically just set, tells the sovereign, I just want to see you one more time. That's how loyal this guy is. He just wants to see one more time. And um, then he goes to see his wife and the nurse who raised him. Uh, if this is weird, uh, it's not actually that weird. In the old days for nobility, a rot. Oh, that's my alarm. Nobility would often... The, the, the maid, or how can I say it, the servant who raised you would often raise your children, right? Because people had kids with them in about 20 years, right? 20, 25 years. So normally your maid servant who raised you, like who your parents had raised you, would then join your house and raise you. So this woman's in the story too, which is quite interesting. Then we start getting pleas for Naritsune's life. And this one's actually different. Uh, this is... I think his name's Norimori. Do I have him on here? Let's see. Um, where's my slide? There it is. Oh, we don't have it. So here we have the kind of, we have the start to plea for the lives of these people. So the first one we get is from family members. And I'm skipping around for it. Oh, here we go. Yep. So when he first shows up, Nori Mori tries to protect him. Now, if you don't know all these names, you look in the back, and that's what I'm doing too. And this is why this edition's a good edition. I actually pick correct editions, because sometimes they're annoying. So Nori Mori is the third Kiyomori's fourth brother. So Kiyomori's fourth brother is related to Narichika. So if you've noticed, right, all these people are intermarried. So again, Kiyomori wants to kill him, too, because his dad just got exiled, and he's going to do something, too. Now, Norimori tries to argue with Kiyomori, who is super pissed. If you haven't noticed, Kiyomori gets real mad. And Norimori is only able to convince him, his older brother, to not kill his, his, you know, his relative, 
by threatening retirement. He's like, I will quit the world. And if you remember what that means, is he becomes a monk. Now, if you remember, Kilmore is a monk, but he's a bad monk. Right? He never actually goes to a monastery. His brother's threatening to actually be a monk and drop everything. And then we get this interesting talk. Let's see, on 90, we get some father talk. Where is this? Uh, they're talking to each other. It is a wonderful thing, he said. Thanks to your intercession, I should live a little longer. But life itself is precious to me, only so that I can, one last time, be together with my father. If his fate is to be beheaded, then what good could my living do? I would rather have you instead beg that we should die together. And this, that was... Narichika, kind of giving you his character, right? Very filial, very Confucian there. And Nordy Mori looked deeply distressed. I did my best for you, you know, but I simply could not mention your father. This morning Shigemori spoke at length to Kiyomori about him, and I gather that for now he is out of danger. And so basically you get kind of filial piety. And Nordy Mori reflected that, like, yes, the true tie binds parent to child. Why people are right to have children. Uh, why is that funny? Is because earlier he said, why would you ever want to have children if this is the suffering the children cause? So it's kind of the Confucian argument for even when they cause you trouble, why kids are worth it. All right, now we get, if we had the lesser remonstrance, now we have the full remonstrance. So, this one gets worse. Um, why is the other one the lesser and this is the major? Well, we get Kiyomori's sacred dream flashback. Uh, let me get there. Oh, yeah. This is when he went to his family shrine and he had a sacred dream. Where is this? He talks about the pillow he got, or the lance he got from his pillow by being loyal to a certain deity. But then flashes back. And then we get him getting really angry. And Shigemori thinks he's already dead. And Kiyomori, and here we go, this is on the page of 91. Uh, but Kiyomori it has full length armor, and his men are all ready to bear down on the cloistered emperor's residence. He claims that his means to keep the cloistered emperor confined to his mansion, but secretly he intends to banish him to Kyushu. And where is this? Oh yeah. The idea struck Shigemori as preposterous, this is on 92, but his father and his mood of that morning seemed quite capable of such insanity. He raced to Nichihachijo as fast as the carriage would go. At the gate, he alighted and entered. And then he, expl he describes his dad. And basically there's his father surrounded by, you know, all the soldiers in armor. And then, I love this, uh, about mid-92, where it has the indent, it says this. Lord Kiyomori lowered his gaze. Quote, oh no, not again. Unquote. He must have grown to himself. Quote, here comes, looking so high and mighty, as though he were better than anyone else. Oh, how I'd like to give him a piece of my mind. Unquote. And notice, the strongest man, besides the emperor, in the realm doesn't actually say what's in between the unquote. It's pretty funny. And then Shigomori sees himself down here and defends the emperor. And then the, basically the dad, he guilts the dad into talking first and the dad basically says why I should exile him somewhere I prefer. And then uh, Shigamori defends him, and he intercedes for the emperor himself. And basically, Shigamori, this is all, all of this is shows like the real values. This is, uh, it shows where like, it's right to correct your father. Where is this? Yeah, this is an interesting two pages. And how like, we don't actually have the right to remove an emperor. It's both against the constitution and it makes us bad Confucians and Buddhists. And he actually, like, breaks into tears and convince, convinces his dad to not go get the emperor right now. Now, the, the second interesting bit, the follow-up to this, is here. Here we go. And this is an interesting values chapter. Signal fires. Uh, um, Sigamori makes an argument for his own court rank. And then why he, he, he is having trouble being filial to his father and defending the emperor. And he basically 
says, Dad, don't make me make the choice where I have to choose my piety to you and my loyalty to the Emperor. And the dad backs down. But then immediately, this is very interesting, Shigemori calls all the men of the Heike clan to his house, like an emergency, to basically to scare his dad. And then this is where we get the Signal Fires chapter. It's from a Chinese story where an Emperor had a, a lady-in-waiting, let's say, and she would never smile unless she saw the signal fires. And eventually, and they're used to show the barbarians are coming, right? And they'd keep lighting the signal fires all the time to make her smile. So finally, when the barbarians showed up, the soldiers didn't show up and they got conquered. And of course, the woman was a mythical creature, not an actual woman. Which is uh, something. So it's basically the boy who cried wolf, Japanese style. So he said, he actually told the soldiers this. Like, I, the problem that existed does no longer exist, but I want to make sure you come. This is not a boy crawling wolf. But actually, in the, in the kind of ed, op-ed of the chapter, it says, Shigemori knew there was no problem. He was just testing who would show up. <laughs> so this is showing you to Shigemori, even though he seems like a softy, he has the support of basically all the men. And where is this? Uh, and there's a good quote here at the end of uh, the chapter on signal fires on 99. It says, No doubt it was fortunate karma that raised him to minister and commander, but it was hard to believe that a man could so excel in conduct and bearing, and, even in wisdom and learning, tower so over all other men. And, when the state has a minister able to remonstrate the ruler, that state is settled and secure. When a household has a son willing to remonstrate with his father, that household is properly ordered. So it is said, not in ancient times or in these latter days of ours has there been any, has there ever been any like him. So the authors like Shigemori. Now, uh, if you notice here, they say latter days a lot. Uh, what does latter days mean? Well, the Western version of that would be like end times in like a Christian sense, right? Like, the apocalypse is coming. So, it's it's something to keep in mind. When they say latter days, they are specifically referring to, you know, kind of the end is near, everything's collapsing. It's not a positive meaning, right? It means like the end of the age is nigh. All right. And finally, for chapter two, we get the exile of Natachika. This is the sun, right? So we get a really long tale of exile and how he got promoted. And, uh, is there anything here I want to talk about? It just talked about how kind of painful his exile is. Let's see. And he even talked about how he tried to save the boy and the dad, but he couldn't do it. And both Natachika and his dad got sent to very... How can I say it? Very random places. So, and this is this is basically to, who gets exiled? All the supporters of the emperor. So the Heike are basically now they're doing their power play for all power. All right. So this is what we missed from the last slide. And here's a cool picture of a ox chariot surrounded by 12th century Japanese warriors. It's good to have wonderful graphics. We have any questions so far? Now is the time for questions, and uh, otherwise we're gonna keep going. Alright, uh, I'll let the questions come as they come. We are still streaming, good. The live stream's still fine, great. Oh yeah, I'd like to actually bring it back for a sec. Yeah, the Japanese, ancient Japan art has some definitely interest. It's very distinctive, for sure. But yeah, there's a lot of cool paintings from this period, if you're curious. The Heike as well, art, it, like, since the 12th century, they've been drawing, like, doing great art from it. So, and our book, if you're curious, our book is all Tokugawa print. So this was like a mass-produced book, and that's like the printmaking of all of these slightly more high-res pictures. And we'll be using some of those pictures today, too. Like, uh, the, I'll give you an example. If you have the book, I sure hope you do. But if you had a book that didn't have all the cool pictures, what are you doing with your life? All right, like last time we talked about the the palace, the, the sacred palakin getting attacked near the palace. This is that woodblock print of it. And these are, these are woodblock prints for the mass market. That's why they're, each one fits a page, because they were designed to fit pages. And there's my finger. Great. 
All right, so let's keep going. Yeah, the... If somebody's saying, wow, do you have a different version of the book? And if you do, you should get the cooler version of the book. Trust me. The, the Penguin Classic one, just the graphics alone make it worth owning. All right. And, oh yeah, here we go. And here's a nice picture of a Japanese garden in fall. Just because, you know, it's nice. Oh, you haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, we'll be looking for the pictures. So hopefully it'll help you memory it too. Not just for you, for everybody. All right, so now we're still in Chapter 2. i got to update my notes. There goes Nadachika. There's the intro. Now we're at Akoya Pine. Um, this chapter, what's interesting here, a couple things. Ah. Lots of people are banished, including Naritsune. The dad and the son both get banished. Um, and there's just this interesting story of a search for a pine. And uh, both the Narachika and Naritsune almost run into each other, and they're trying really hard to hide them from each other. Now, the dad is Narachika. Um, Narachika gets exiled. He's the one that Lesser rinse, rinse, Remonstrance was for, right? But, uh... He doesn't make it much longer, let's be honest. So he heard of his son's banishment. He renounced the world, right? Becomes a monk. His wife writes some letters. She actually is able to smuggle them out to him. And he basically knows he's gonna die. And, uh, Narachika's murdered. You ready? So, um... First they try to poison him. He's a monk now, right? He's just... So, yeah. He's trying to just, you know, he's just trying to be a monk in exile. They try to murder him with poison. They can't do that. And then, how are the Heike going to kill him? Well, uh, they get a 50-foot cliff and put bamboo spikes at the bottom and push him over the cliff. And a uh, very horrible way to die. But yeah, he heard of his son's banishment. He's murdered basically for political reasons, because he's a favorite of the emperor. And, um... It's so bad. His wife hears about it, and she renounces the world and takes her renounces the world and takes her kids with her. And then they just pray for the soul of their dad, which is probably the most Confucian Buddhist thing I've ever heard. But you'll see a lot of that in the story, right? Like when somebody's family gets you know nuked for political reasons, then they will, generally speaking, pray for their souls. And in Buddhism, that works. Like you can pray for the dead. All right. All right, now this one we get. This is what's kind of funky. We get a random, like one-off character, uh, Tokudaiji Sane Sada. Does a pilgrimage to Ikutsushima. Now, if you don't remember Ikutsushima, that's the favorite temple of the Heike. This guy got over. He got uh, passed over for promotion by the Heike because they're unjust. And one of his ministers basically had the idea to like go on a use religion for political gain basically right to do cynical religion so for those of you here who are cynical of religion you'll appreciate that uh if somebody asks what's the difference between paying for the dead in buddhism compared for other religions um depends on the religion um of the big ones buddhist prayer is kind of like medieval catholic prayer what i and what i mean is like you're praying for the souls of the dead and for buddhists it's to help their like karmic outcomes and for catholics it's to get them out of purgatory right so it's that idea that your prayers can have some effect now for buddhists and christians or catholics anyway right so you can pray for the dead uh traditional like confucius pray for the dead but they don't commit too much they have a metaphysics for it right like why you pray for the dead but it's more out of respect than you can do anything for them if that makes sense and it's more it's more like bribing them to not do anything to you if anything but it's respect too of course so it'd be superstition if you're scared of them and respect if you are not scared of them that's what i would say but yeah it's like other religious traditions for praying for the dead it's an important part of it yep it's a good question i'm glad i have some answer <laughs> all right um, so this is a story of a lord passed, passed over, and then he uses the Heike temple to basically mercenary his way into a position. And the funny part, of course, uh, it works. And it was his advisor's advice. Uh, the death of... Uh, this is the next one, sorry, not the death of Narichika. This is the 
Tokudaiji, yep. So he basically is able to get... He's, he basically plays Kiyomori. So it shows that Kiyomori is not the brightest. And also some people cynically do religion. It's an interesting chapter for that. It's, but it's, it mostly just shows us more of Kiyomori's character. Alright. Now. Now we get something called the Battle with Rank and File Monks. This chapter is funky. But basically... Remember I talked about there was monks who were real monks? Like scholar monks? Let's say they're like actually monks. And then there's like novice monks who are just warriors who've retired from life but are still warriors, but they're still monks. They're like half in, half out. Basically, the Mount Hei has a giant civil war where the rank-and-file monks fight the scholar monks and win, and then they take over, even with government help. The government manages to lose. <laughs> horribly where this big mountain gets taken over by and the next chapter is literally called this oh yeah it's the politics of religion oh yeah and the separation between squalor monks and the rank and file and they're lay practitioners slash novitiates right a lay practitioner is you going to a temple or you or me going to a church right that's what a lay practitioner is uh a novitiate is like what would the Catholic version, or the the Christian version would be if you're in a really liturgical church, like lesser orders, right? Like you're a reader at the mass, you're not actually the priest. So all these assistant guys who are just like hanging around the monks, there's a big politic, political battle, and there's a civil war, and the actual monks lose. So then we get to this chapter. Oh, sorry, yeah. And there's a monks in the civil war. This is interesting. Kiyomori backs the scholars. They lose because the lay guys double down. And before the monks and the military gets there, they recruit a bunch of pirates and bandits to take over this giant mountain full of Buddhist temples. And this just kind of gives you the flavor of the age. It's almost randomly dropped in there, almost like a pillow book reference. But the importance is, it shows just like, man, this period is just random. Like, everything's collapsing. It's like one of the biggest temples in Japan just has like a failure cascade. And then the next one is literally, do I have it on here? I hope I do. Yeah, the next one's called the Ruin of Mount Hei, right? Like, so this whole shrine, it, this one's really sad, but it's the, it talks about how the whole temple collapses, and it's, an, it's about the eventual collapse of latter days, a.k.a. we're in the time when civilization's falling apart. And it, it's falling apart because there's no scholars. All the lay people are there, but they actually needed the leadership of the religious leaders. And it's all collapsing, it's just kind of showing the general degradation of this time period. All right. Then we get more problems to show you, like, these are the, again, this is a Buddhist epic, right? So showing you that there's spiritual significance to material corruption. That's basically the argument here. So now, Zen Koji, and if you don't know what G means in Japanese, a lot of the times it just means temple. So the Zen Ko Temple. So now a temple gets destroyed by fire. And then there's a quote here again. It's the it's the kind of moral quote. I'm gonna I wrote it in my notes, but I want to give it to you from the book. Let's see, 118. So this temple just randomly gets destroyed by fire. But on 118, it mentions this. Um, it, so it was a, a temple that survived for 580 years. But at the end, it says this quote: "When ruin threatens the sovereign's way, the Buddha's way collapses first, or so they say." which may explain why so many hollow temples were destroyed. Their loss announces the people claimed the end of the sovereign way. So this idea that not only is there like a, like a, a correct way to rule, but when the Buddhist order collapses, the sovereign's order also will collapse. They're tied together, basically. So it's like a... It's, a, it's, a, it's like a spiritual element of the political order. That's basically what this book is talking about. All right. Yeah, and then here's the quote and the page number. It's a great quote. I love this quote so much. All right, and the stream's holding on. Great. All right. Now we get um, Yasuyori's prayer. Why did I say Yoshi's? That's not even right. Okay, I'm going to fix it. Hold on. It's probably that one. That's not it. Dang it. Uh, that one. Is it Yasuyori? Did I just... Oh, I wrote it wrong there. Okay, Yasuyori. 
Japanese names transcribed into English don't always go well. Okay. Oh. Yes. Yes. Yori. Okay. And save. And resume slideshow. There we go. Yes, Yori's player. Okay. Now this is the story where we get. Earlier we talked about the exile of some people, right? A, a whole group of people got exiled. Now Yasuyori got exiled with two other guys. Now, they're interesting mostly because they're these guys got placed sent to a place called Kak uh, Kakai Gashima. This is like 30 miles south of the big Japanese island. And here we have um, Naritsune, who's the son of the guy who got murdered and thrown off the hill. Uh, Yasuyori, who's a monk and used to be a government worker. And we have one more guy. Where was his name? Oh, yeah. The third guy exiled on this island is also called Shunkan. This is funny. Um, and the commentary we get about him, however, he ignored them, never having been a man of any kind of faith. Now, why is pointing that out interesting? Uh... He's a monk. <laughs> so even in this time, there's skeptical monks who do not actually believe the faith, right? They're forced to become monks for political reasons or they do it for economic reasons. But he's like, so the two out of three, so Yasuyori and, I think it's Naritsuka, wait, Naritsune. Naritsune is the son, yeah. So Naritsune and Yasuyori are praying. They may actually make a shrine to their gods and pray there all the time. And the third guy, Shunkan, is a skeptic. He's like, nah, it's not gonna work. So they actually on this little on this island, how bad is this island? You're gonna love it. They don't speak Japanese, barely anyway. No farming, no any kind of industry. So they can barely keep themselves alive. And they really only keep themselves alive because of Naritsune's family basically sends them stuff sometimes. So these two guys decide to spend their time praying, and the third guy is our token skeptic. Now what happens? This is interesting. We get the chapter where it's called Stupas Cast Into the Sea. And they're actually called, there's, the, uh, the translator for some reason used the non-Japanese for this. Which is, there's called Sotoba in Japanese. And there's actually an image here. This is a very interesting uh, devotion. Let me find it. Oh yeah, here we go. Oh, and Signal Fire, we had a picture for Signal Fire. Uh, just if you're curious. This was the signal fire, all the warriors rushing to Shigamori's house. So, it's, an, it's a little blurry though, I could have done a better picture. Alright, and then we have this one, when they're doing the work. So Yasuyori seated making supas while Shunkan, who's not mentioned, looks on. So these are little commemorative sticks he's hand carving. Now what is he putting on them? So greatly he did for long for home, that desperate Yasuyori also made a thousand sotoba. Each marked with a Siddham A, and that is a, it's a symbol from Sanskrit that is a, a holy symbol. He put the date, his true and common names, and two poems he had written. He says, first, here, alas, am I, marooned on a tiny isle, far off Satsuma. Take the news to my father, winds that blow across the sea. And he also says, second one, and he's carving this, mind you. Spare a thought for me, when abroad on a journey, sure not to be long, I still find my heart aching, only to go home again. So he took him out to the seashore, and he said, Hail and obsidians to the refuge, he intoned. O Brahma and Indra, O four great heavenly kings, O gods who come packed with earth, O guardian powers of the city, and above all, O mighty gods, Kumano, Itsuku, Shima, carry one of these at least all the way to the capital. And he throws a thousand of these things into the ocean. Uh, somebody asked a question I missed. Let me see this. Oh, I should actually check for both for questions. Ooh, I missed a question. Let me see this one. Here we go. So somebody says, does that mean laymen in religious terms are just people that go to temples? Yes. Laymen are non... people who haven't been, like, sworn in as official members. I mean, like, um... Like, if you're a Buddhist, you shave your head and join the monastery forever. Does that make sense? That's a non-layman. 
so you become a monk full time, not just like uh, you're hanging out at the monastery or praying at the monastery. Same thing would be for Christians, like if you became a priest in like an orthodox sense. So you, you took on holy orders, like you actually joined the organization, as opposed to you just go to church and do the church thing, or go to temple and pray. That's what that means. Okay, so these, this guy, the monk guy, Yasuyori, threw a thousand of these into the ocean. A thousand. Not five, a thousand. Minimum. Now, what's interesting here... Uh, he, one reason he did it is he had a prayer, but he had a, basically a dream that inspired him to do it. And it said, uh, oh, he prayed so much, this is the dream he had. This is on uh, 121. Your prayers reach the gods, swift and forever mighty, in such profusion that you may well, after all, see the capital once more. Oh, and even better, that was not even a dream. Sorry, there was a dream before that. They found that nod on a leaf that blew to them after all their prayers on this island. So, he throws these in the water, right? Okay, and it's the other side of Japan, basically. And then, in Ikutsujima, the island of the shrine, and by the way, this is in the Japan Sea. I gotta find a picture of this. Hold on, let me, let me open my best browser ever. Okay. Oh, here we go. Easy. I'm just going to show you that. All right. Here's a quick map of Japan. Literally, they're down here. Okay, at the bottom of Japan. Can I make this bigger? Oh, here we go. Yeah. So they're down here on the little island, trapped. And they throw a thousand of these little wood things into the ocean. Now, the natural current takes them towards China. But somehow, one of these little sotoba go all the way here, through the inland sea, to near Hiroshima. And now the capital's over here, like if you don't know Japan geography. This is the capital area here. But still, it manages to go from like down here, all one of these little lame sand islands, I think it's like this, one of these small ones. It goes all the way up here, all the way to Hiroshima. And somebody finds it. Not only does somebody find it, this is the funniest part. Now a certain monk related to Yasuyori, which is the guy in the picture. Where'd my picture go? Uh, yeah, that guy. A monk related to him is traveling through the western provinces and is even thinking of going to the island to check on him. Now as he's on his pilgrimage at this shrine, he finds one of these Sotowa and then he brings it back to Kyoto and shares the story with a bunch of people. And it's so it's so popular and so like extraordinary. This is a 124, 125. Um, they, people are even shocked they're still alive. And then this information gets to Shigemori. And Shigemori shows it to his dad. And even Kiyomori starts to get, we'll say soft. And it says at the very end of this chapter, neither stock nor stone, Kiyomori, even he, seem to respond with pity so it worked this is the this is the funny part of the story so these these things being cast in the sea wasn't just like a random hope like it had an effect there was an effect so the sotoba go to ikutsushima and then a guy literally carries it to the capital because they know who he is like somebody who knows him finds it it's like dude it's my like brother-in-law it's my cousin he sent this wow and it goes back to the capital and now even kiyomori feels some pity do i have it on here oh yeah so these Sotoba make it all the way to the capital, and then there's this quote, perhaps it shows what truly passionate fervor can achieve in life, which is very interesting. And uh, so Kimori actually, is that in this chapter? Let me see. Let's see. There, yeah, there's a couple Chinese allusions here, but then they talk about kind of the power of what faith can do. And they even compare it to a Chinese story where a guy what was it a general invaded a place and got his leg cut off and spent 20 years on a hill and then wrote a note to the emperor put it on a goose and flew to the emperor and gave it to him pretty mysterious oh, pretty mysterious but we've got lag let's see if we're back we'll give that a second okay dropping frames looks like 
we're dying. Let's see. This would be the perfect time to die, to be honest. Okay, looks like we're still going. There was just some super leg. Oop. Okay, it looks like we're competing with Evening Internet. All right, yeah. So my I, uh, my uh, OBS has a, it shows me what the stream percentage is and what my dropped frames are. So I when I see the frames are dropping high hardcore, I slow down what I'm saying because it's basically going to only record locally. Can you guys hear me right now? Actually, it is. It's break time, so it's a perfect time to die. Okay, it's fine now. All right, well, I, this was the end of my slide. Hold on, where's my slide? And we're going to get into part three now, but it is 6.15, so we're going to take a 10-minute break. So I'm going to stop the stream here. We're going to start again at 6.27. I need a drink, so I'm going to get something to drink. We'll be back in 10 minutes. We'll go as far as we can, and then uh, we'll finish it next week. So 10-minute break, and we'll be back. Uh, if you're a community member, welcome. Uh, we're going to start here. Besides that, I'll see you all in 10 minutes.